So again, this is a review. But rather than um, trying to get you to Mach 5 on day 2, I like to actually kind of ramp up. Much of this material you're going to find is a review type of format. But maybe you didn't know, whoops, sorry, maybe you didn't know this. What is that in the upper right? Right A, the picture in the upper right, the left picture. So microscope. Does anybody know what the uh, image to the right of the microscope is? It's not animal skin, but that's a good guess. Cork. Who said cork? Yes, it's cork. So that's one of the first structures that was looked at under the microscope, was cork. And uh, this is Robert Hooke's microscope from about the mid-1600s. Our microscope today isn't a whole lot different. A little fancier, costs a lot more. We have better resolution. But we've been doing this for a long time as a field. And we've gotten pretty good at looking at things microscopically. So you're going to see in lab the use of the microscope. You're going to see next week um, when we get into cell biology, you're going to see that we're going to start looking deep into tissues. What's this on the lower left? One of my daughters said, it looks like a peacock, Dad. <laughs> that's her personality. That is like totally dumb. But that's actually cholesterol, sweetheart. She's like, oh, that sounds fun. Um, it's only fun if you have enough of it, but you have too much, it kills you. She's like, oh, I think it should be a peacock. <laughs> but that is actually cholesterol, and you need cholesterol. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about cholesterol later on. We may not get to it today. Cholesterol, contrary to popular opinion, is actually not bad for you. Here's the challenge is you make about 85% of what you need. So you don't need an exogenous source like in your diet at high levels. The problem is, is a lot of our diets have high levels of cholesterol in them. Little children don't really need to worry too much about cholesterol. Just peacocks. <laughs> because... Um, Cholesterol is an integral part of the cell membrane. It helps maintain the structure, the shape, and the integrity of the cell membrane. And so when cells are growing and dividing and the organism is getting bigger, and more cells are aggressively being added, how much cholesterol is needed? Lots. But once you pass your growth phase, and your epiphyseal plates, otherwise known as your growth plates, close, you don't need that much cholesterol anymore. We'll talk about when those plates close in our skeletal lecture. We'll talk about those growth plates. We'll talk about epiphyseal plates. Okay. So sometimes things that are healthy for us turn into problems because we're in a different phase as an organism in life. All right, so we'll get there. All right, for right now, what is this? What is it? It's not a peacock, but it's very colorful. I asked my daughter, she's like, I don't know, but it's very colorful. <laughs> what was it? Aluminium. This, oh, the, the very, very specific one here, if you're from the UK, you would call this aluminium. Okay, but if you're here, you might say it a different way. What would it be called? <laughs> Aluminum. Both would be correct, but I actually, you stole my joke. I was about to go there, but that's awesome. <laughs> Aluminium on the periodic table of the elements. Okay, this is review. But what I'd like you to be able to figure out and tell me is um, how many neutrons does aluminum have? How many neutrons does um, aluminum have? Turn to your neighbor and answer it and then explain how you got it. Well, you take 
the 26.98, which is really what? The atomic mass, it's really 27. And you subtract from it, right, the number of protons, which is 13, and that gives you your number of neutrons. Okay, so just as a review, might you see something like that on the exam? You bet. Okay? How about this one? Somebody gonna tell me I didn't take organic chemistry. Okay? Which one of these is actually not an organic molecule? So don't vote yet. Think about it. You're like, oh, those are those are actually molecules. Scott, okay, that was a big hit. How many would vote for A? How many vote for B? How many? Vote strong. Don't be like, oh, never mind. <laughs> right? you got to be very confident. How many vote for C? How many vote for uh, D? How many vote for E? Okay, so the E's look like they might have it. Why is it E? There's no carbon? What's right here? What's right here? So obviously the only requirement can't be that it has to have carbon. Sir in the back. Has to have hydrogenated carbons. Carbon dioxide is not actually technically an organic molecule. Okay, there's no hydrogenated carbons. So that is extremely accurate. So that is the working definition that we're going to use. Okay, is it organic molecule has to have hydrogenated carbons, meaning hydrogen ions are actually attached to it. Well, in chemistry, a lot of folks will argue of what's more important, inorganic elements or organic. Well, we're going to do something very diplomatic when we say both are extremely important. Well, no, I'll be honest. Um, the organism can't survive without both. And you take one critical inorganic component away, and the organism's dead, like O2. Non-organic? Yes. It's an inorganic molecule, oxygen. There's not even, you know, a single hydrogen uh, there. But you don't have enough O2, you can't do cellular respiration, you don't have ATP, and you actually expire. Um, organic compounds, like cholesterol. What happened to the cellular membrane if cholesterol was gone? It would disintegrate. So both organic and inorganic are absolutely critical. Organic chemistry has been around for ages. Even in early Chinese civilizations, uh, they used a lot of these herbal extracts. They still do today. And they would elevate blood pressure in failing patients. Come to find out, when you um, take Western medicine, you start to isolate what those compounds are. Um, they contain ephedrine in these herbal extracts. In other um, cultures in Europe, like in the Middle Ages, there was a blue mold on a piece of bread that sat too long. Someone discovered that you actually utilize that and pack it in a wound. Must have been a weird scientist. Like, oh, sweetie, you fell and you have a really gaping hole. Here, let me stuff some of this moldy bread in there. <laughs> I mean, how else did that happen? Well, that was actually penicillin. That's how penicillin was discovered. A penicillin is a, is, a, is a mold, okay? It's a blue bread mold that was the precursor to penicillin that we use today. I mean, if you're on penicillin, you're not, you know, swallowing pills of blue bread mold. We've gotten more sophisticated than that. But this was penicillium, which was a precursor in a blue bread mold. So organic chemistry has been around for a long time, but so has inorganic chemistry. So if we look at the molecules of life, you need both. You don't just have to have organic molecules for life to exist. You actually do need inorganic compounds. Carbon-based is the definition. Um, things that we're going to get to here very quickly, some of which today, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, and proteins. These are all examples of organic compounds. But the inorganics can't be ignored. Look at those. Look at the list of important ones. Uh, water, 
We're 50 to 75% water as an organism. If you take water out of us, we die. If you take too much water out, you drop to like 40% hydration levels, that patient is probably pretty close to shock. They can't maintain adequate blood pressure, and the brain is not receiving enough oxygen. The brain will stop, and the heart will stop shortly after that. A lot of gases and minerals. Okay? This is just to see if anybody starts twitching nervously in the back rows or in the front here with these sp orbitals. Okay? But the compounds, if we look at carbon and nitrogen, sodium and potassium, all of these are critical to life. Not all of them are organic and not all of them are inorganic. When we look at atoms, we're going to go quickly through this review because I know you had it. But the atom is the smallest unit of matter that retains all the properties of that substance. As you remember, it has a nucleus with protons and neutrons, and the electrons orbit around it, and you've probably studied in your chemistry courses where those electrons are actually found in the different energy levels for the different compounds. Um, if we look at the composition of life, in living material, we talked the last time we were together that we agree that life begins at the cellular level, although there is evidence in the literature to suggest that mitochondria at one point in time might have been early phases of life, but now they don't exist by themselves. So the best answer on the exam would still be cell is where life begins. Answer C for cell, okay? That might be D or B or A, but, or E for that matter, but... Cell is the correct answer. When we look at 96% of all the atoms in the body, they're primarily oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. The remaining 4%, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, K is potassium, and sulfur. And then we're mostly water by composition. This is in an aqueous environment, and part of the reason for it is water is such a unique component of life, right? Our astronomer friends are always looking for water in the, in, in the world, in, in the universe. If they can find water, they're um, really excited about the possibility of life. So if we look at some of the other components that are inorganic, like minerals, this composes about 4% of our body weight not by content, but just by body weight percentage, the minerals, because minerals are actually fairly heavy. Mostly calcium and mostly phosphorus, and you'll find most of that in the bone architecture. And we'll get there in the later units of what the bone is made up of. But this is where some of your early prerequisite courses are starting to come into play. Some of you get frustrated, why do I have to memorize all this stuff? Well, it's important for you to be familiar with these components of life because if we start looking at the organism and you start treating bone diseases and you don't have any understanding of the importance of calcium or what it's going to do or the phosphorus levels, you could inappropriately cause brittle bones in that patient. Okay? So understanding what these building blocks of life are are critically important for this class. That's why we make you take the stuff in sequence. We're not trying to be mean. Okay? We're trying to make you successful in getting you ready. The body structure, that's bones. Enzymes, nucleic acids, ATP, that's adenosine triphosphate. You don't have that, you're no longer alive. And nerve impulses. Right? All of these are where you're going to find these inorganic elements. Uh, we also see them in coenzymes, like in iodine and in iron. Iron is important for oxygen binding. If you can't bind oxygen in the blood, you can't transport it to the tissues that you need. And then also gases, like oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitric oxide. I think everyone knows we breathe in oxygen, or we, ex we breathe in air, we extract oxygen out of the air and we expel or get rid of carbon dioxide. The reason that we do that, in part, is we need the oxygen, and then we want to release the carbon dioxide because it can be a contributor to acidic pH levels in the body. Question? I'm wondering, is the reason why 
carbon monoxide is so deadly because it bonds with the iron instead of O2, and that's how you die from carbon monoxide poisoning? That's true. Carbon monoxide has a higher affinity for um, the hemoglobin molecule, but it's the iron component on hemoglobin, and so it binds preferentially and it blocks oxygen from binding. Anemic, yes. Anemia would be low iron levels. You'll get dizzy, you'll have less energy, you'll be listless, you want to go to sleep. Um, that's one of the side effects of anemia, which is low iron levels within the blood. So that, these are perfect examples of clinical applications of why carbon monoxide poisoning, which happens a lot in this region of the world, it happens a lot actually, unfortunately, on the lake. Because carbon monoxide from the boats likes to sit right on the surface of the water, right about where you're bobbing your head as you're waiting for the you know, boat to move on and take the, the ski rope with it. Very serious topic. Okay, so this community, unfortunately, we're struck with these kinds of accidents with carbon monoxide poisoning. Anemia. Okay, you're, I guarantee you in the future you will interact with patients that suffer from anemia. Okay? Or they might be slightly anemic and not even realize it. Just, you know, I just don't feel so. It's a little bit more prevalent in females than it is in men. And that's a lot because once a month, there's a large amount of blood that leaves the body. And if there's not enough iron in the diet to supplement the manufacture of new red blood cells that are functioning with iron, that can be a challenge. Then you add on to it, what if there's a dietary restriction for that individual, whether it's required or whether it's a choice, and they're limiting the amount of red meat that they eat, which is a huge source of iron. So they may not know that they're iron deficient, and their lifestyle is actually going to compromise it further. Okay, so these, do you need to know about iron? It's like, I don't need to know about this iron crap. I'm going to be like a doctor. You know, I'm going to like fix people. Well, this all make makes sense. Does it all help you? Yes, sir. Uh, I was just curious about what you said about the carbon uh, monoxide on the lake. Does uh, this elevation of the lake uh, affect the amount or now? Not necessarily. No. It's a gas. So um, if you see uh, some of the nicer houseboats, a lot of times from their generator, they actually have a big smokestack that goes up to the roof. So they actually pipe the exhaust far away from the water surface. Especially because the slides on the houseboats are on the back usually, and that's where the generator is. So they'll put the smokestack up higher. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, if you bubble it under the water, it eventually kind of works its way up and just kind of sits there. If, it's not, if there's not any wind, which is the best time to water ski when, you know, or wait, you know, wait for when it's glass, um, that's, that's when a lot of these challenges happen. And of course, these are usually people that aren't wearing life jackets. So there are ways to avoid this. I mean, if you pass out and you're in a life jacket, Someone can come in and get you. But if you pass out and you go down and they can't find you, especially on Lake Powell where some of the water is 420 feet deep, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty rough. Okay, so let's talk about some of the benefits of water to take it a little bit more positive. Water has some unique properties to it. Water is a um, polar covalent molecule. It's hydrophilic, which means it likes itself, right? Water liking. And it has a 105 degree angle that's created that allows for these partial charges to occur. This is really important because it creates these hydrogen bonds. What are hydrogen bonds? They're like a weak attraction or a weak force, not necessarily a strong force. They can be broken. But it gives it its unique characteristic. You've seen some of these water bugs floating on the surface of a pond. Those hydrogen bonds create a surface tension of water that allows for that. That's what you're observing the effect of. Well, these hydrogen bonds are usually between a slightly positive hydrogen atom in one molecule, in one atom, and a slightly negative oxygen or nitrogen in the other. So they're weak, they can be broken, but you can see here on this diagram where they're going to occur. And so you get these linkages that occur from one water molecule to another, independent of the covalent bond, which is a very strong bond, 
versus these hydrogen bonds. The covalent bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, you, you would have trouble breaking that. You'd actually put energy in in order for that to take place. What this does for us, going back to the previous slide, is it creates the ability for a great solvent. What does that mean? Stuff can dissolve in it. That's important for life. Is you need to dissolve stuff. Solutes, sodium, ions, need to be dissolved in solution so that the organism can actually use it. So the solute is the substance that's dissolved, like salt. The solvent is the dissolving agent. So the solution would be an example here. You write in a little white space. Um, salt water. Right? Salt water is the solution, or saline. These bags of saline that hang on these little rolly carts in the hospital, they're not full of water. They were full of water when you're pumping water into the vessel. You potentially could kill the patient. Okay? You need to pump in a saline. So you pump in the solvent, which is the dissolving agent, which is water, and the solute is sodium chloride. And it'll say on the bag what percent of sodium chloride it is. So why is it that water is such a great solvent? Well, <clears throat> stuff dissolves in it really well, right? The solution, again, the blanks here, is the solvent plus the solute. Oil, on the other hand, is hydrophobic. It doesn't like to dissolve in water. In the way that you can break up oil so that it can go into solution, like when you're doing your dishes, is you add a detergent. So on the drawing here on the right, this is a phospholipid. And as we move into the next series of lectures, we're going to see how the phospholipid bilayer that makes up the membrane helps to separate things from one side to another. You can compartmentalize. Now that you can compartmentalize and you have fluid inside water with solute, you can actually start creating compartments where life can actually take place. So the detergent bonds to the oil, the lipid part, and also to the water at the same time. So it allows it to go into solution, and that's why you can actually break up grease or oil with detergents. The detergent has the ability to do that because it has a hydrophilic end, and it has a hydrophobic end. In fact, this fossil lipid bilayer has a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. The hydrophobic end is the tail, and the hydrophilic end is the head. And so it's most accurate to say that a fossil lipid is actually amphiphilic. Remember that word? It's not really correct at all to say that it's hydrophilic or that it's hydrophobic. It's more correct to say that it's amphiphilic. So if you have that option on the exam, a fossil lipid is A, hydrophilic, B, hydrophobic, or C, amphiphilic, what would you pick? Amphiphilic. amphiphilic, C, very good. We'll stop there. I'll see you guys next Wednesday, a week from today, because we have Monday off.